so maybe I'll go ahead and get started. Um, Welcome to the Hitchcock Center, everybody. My name is Jessica Schultz. I am Communication and Living Building Coordinator here at the Hitchcock Center. Uh, I've been here for about seven and a half years now, so I've um, been a part of this Living Building project for um, that entire time, pretty much. Um, we've moved into the building about two and a half years ago, so we've been settling in and enjoying it ever since and providing tours um, twice a month to our community for free. We have tours, uh, and I'm saying this for the video uh, purpose, <laughs> we have videos, um, tours, uh, first Friday of the month at 4 and the third Wednesdays um, at noon, um, and those are free. So who is the Hitchcock Center? How many of you already are familiar with what we do and who we are? Most people, but not everybody. Okay, the quick version is we are an environmental education center. We work with all ages, starting at pre-K up through adults. Obviously, we're all adults here today, so you're part of our community programs. Um, we have a preschool program, an after school, several after school programs. We have homeschool programs. Um, we have field trips for local schools to come to us. We also have classroom programs, and our environmental educators go into the classrooms um, of local schools as well. Um, What's next? So, in building, <laughs> so, so we were, before we moved uh, to this site, we were just about three miles up the road. We were in an old carriage house, which was um, very homey and cozy, and in true New England fashion, had the rope between the floorboards, as many of you may uh, recall. Um, but we were sort of uh, stuffed into our little corners in our staff area, um, and we just had two classrooms in that building. We also leased that building from the town of Amherst. Um, and when we uh, decided to embark on this process of finding a new building for ourselves, we realized we weren't able to add on to that building in that location. There were some wetlands restrictions, some property line restrictions, things that made it a little bit challenging. So we decided to find a new uh, building, and we were invited to consider uh, this location at Hampshire College. We do lease our land from Hampshire, and we own our own building. Um, but we have joined the Cultural Village here at Hampshire. Um, so the Cultural Village is the Eric Carl Museum, uh, the Yiddish Book Center, and the Hitchcock Center as well. So we're in our visitor center today. We welcome uh, the community and families here. Uh, we start with our welcome wall. Um, which I'm not going to go into detail on, but just briefly, um, we welcome people to think about um, how our energy comes from the sun and how composting toilets here at the Hitchcock Center are normal. Um, maybe they could be normal in more places than just the Hitchcock Center. <laughs> there are others, of course, in the state, um, but all of the kids, everybody who comes here, of course, composting toilets are normal. We have a series of ecological principles that form the foundation of all of the programs that we do here at Hitchcock. They also form the foundation of the Living Building Challenge, which is the building certification um, that we are hoping to achieve with this building. Uh, so we're going to talk about the Living Building Challenge as we go on the tour today. I'm not going to go into a great depth on all of it, but we are going to touch on some of the more important pieces of it. So our visitor center, we have uh, several different live animals. We have a painted turtle. We have a spotted turtle who's rarely uh, seen. Um, we have two three-toed box turtles. And we have a corn snake in the front. Uh, all of these animals are ambassador teaching animals. And we do take some of them to classrooms um, to uh, teach from in, in our various uh, curricula. We have all kinds of drawers and things to investigate um, for families and kids who come to visit. We have a library. We've got puzzles, games. Um, we often have parents and small children coming in just to spend an afternoon uh, or a few hours um, exploring here at the Hitchcock Center. We also have a basking boulder in our south-facing front window. It was a boulder that we excavated from the site uh, here. And we placed in that south-facing window just to kind of help um, everyone envision if these animals were to come out into the sun and bask in the solar energy and get that passive solar gain. And what would that look like and what would that feel like? Um, it doesn't quite have that functionality for our building, but it does allow the kids um, to crawl on it and get that sort of sense of, of what that's like. So during our tour today, we're going to start with water. 
We're going to look at some of the building systems in our basement. We're going to talk about energy. We're going to talk about building envelope. And then we're going to talk about a little bit more about water at the very end. Um, so I think we're going to, unless there are questions at this moment, I'm going to transition us to the next space and we'll start the conversation about water. There's no wood turtle here, right? There is no wood turtle here, no. They're, they're rare or, or endangered species? They're either special concern or endangered. I don't remember the no. designation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Follow me, please. Okay. So we call this room our ecotone. An ecotone in ecological terms is a transition between different habitats. And here at the Hitchcock Center, it represents the transition from our south wing, where we have our uh, open office area, our community meeting room, and our visitor center, to our north wing, which is our classroom wing, and also the wing that has most of our building mechanicals in it as well. But we thought this would be a really great space um, to start the conversation about water. And one thing I will say, uh, as we transition, you'll feel that it's colder in here. This is an unconditioned space, which means it has no mechanical heating or cooling, except for some passive uh, ventilation up over this beam. So we do have some rooms uh, in the Hitchcock Center that are similar to this. The bathrooms have no heating and cooling, the ecotone, no heating and cooling, and our storage area and our basement, no heating and cooling. Um, so we were able to save some energy uh, on those spaces. So here in the ecotone, we decided to start the conversation about water on the floor under our feet. We walk around outside and we have a, a whole ecosystem under our feet. And here under our feet is the watershed that we live within, which is of course the Connecticut River watershed or a portion of it. We start in the south with the Westfield and Chicopee rivers. We move up to the north. Uh, this is the Oxbow in the Northampton and East Hampton area. And just by your shoe there is the Salamander, which is where we're located here at the Hitchcock Center in that watershed. Uh, Quabbin Reservoir in the corner, which of course is in our watershed but supplies water for the city of Boston uh, all the way across the state. And then we move north to the Deerfield and Millers Rivers in the Greenfield, Montague, that area, and then on up into Vermont and New Hampshire. We do have a larger display of a little bit more of the watershed um, on the glass uh, in the corner. Um, but it's, of course, a very uh, expansive um, watershed. So from the watershed we live within in the region to our local watershed right here on our site, um, when it rains at the Hitchcock Center, it rains into the building. Water comes in via the yellow pipe on either side from two different roofs. It goes into a black uh, centrifugal filter in the corner, which takes out leaf, leafy debris, seeds, anything that might get through our roof drains. It goes into the green pipe and starts to fill these translucent tanks. We call these translucent tanks our first flush tanks. And the purpose of the first flush inside the building when it fills these tanks primarily is to give us a sense of how much rain we can collect. So 1 16th of an inch of rain across the surface of our roof equals 224 gallons across these four tanks. When these tanks fill, the water pressure pushes back against the green pipe and water can be diverted into the blue pipe and into our reservoir. We have a 6,000 gallon reservoir under the front lawn of our building uh, and that will be eventually the water supply for our building. Because we've had a very rainy weather this fall, you all probably know we've had the rainiest fall in about 200 years, so we get some very heavy rains. Um, so of course, we have more than 6,000 gallons uh, coming down. So water can also be diverted into the bioswale. And the bioswale is an engineered structure that allows water to naturally filtrate back into the earth. So for the purposes of Living Building Challenge, we cannot push water away from our site. We must manage everything that falls on our site on site because there is no away. We don't want to push it into a wetland we want to, or, or a sewer system. We want it to, the water to be managed on this site as if our building was not here. So putting it back into the bioswale is our closest approximation um, to doing that. Um, any questions? How many gallons in the reservoir? You may have said 6,000. 6, yes. Mm -hmm. And you said eventually it will be a water supply? Yes. So we're going to talk about our drinking water when we go down to the basement. <laughs> yes. 
Now this this is an unheated space. That's correct. But everything is insulated. The windows are insulated. I'm assuming the mm -hmm. roof is insulated. Yes. A lot of water in here. So mm -hmm. it never, you know, when we get down to minus two degrees, it never freezes in here? So when these tanks fill with meltwater, which has to happen when the temperature on the roof is at a melting point, right? Um, then water will fill in here. So we've had some melting this week because we had some like 40 degree temperatures. Um, and then the water will go down over a period of say six hours in these tanks. So it's never actually sitting in these tanks oh, for okay. long enough oh, to freeze. Oh, right. so, so it's constantly circulating yes. a little bit so it won't freeze. Yes, exactly. But, it, but it's never going to get that cold in here anyway if you've got these. It, it shouldn't, but I haven't, I can't tell you what the coldest temperature, you know, if I was here at maybe three or four in the morning on our coldest night, mm -hmm. I don't know what the temperature, I can't, I, we haven't tracked that, so I don't have that information. Any other questions at this point? How, how do you get these to be all the way empty? They, the they're not at the bottom. Take a look inside. <laughs> so, <laughs> so these tanks were designed, um, they're custom designed by our architect. Uh, we had design lab architects from Cambridge or Boston uh, who designed our building. And our architect, uh, Sam Batchelor, uh, made a prototype in his backyard, uh, connected it to his downspout and started testing it um, several months before he actually suggested that we do this um, uh, display here. Um, and then he said, hey, I've got this great idea. And we were like, wow, this is super. We all want to know. And when we first moved into the building, and, and even now when kids are new to the center and it's raining, they come running in here because you can hear the rain coming into the tanks. And what does that look like? And you know, how much w can we collect? Because we can all see the puddles filling. We can all see the rivers. There, there, there's more water rushing. But what, what actually is that? How much is it? And none of us knew when we started this project. So these um, aren't demonstration. These are. This is our actual water system this is in the from building. All of the roofs. This is from the north facing roof on the south wing and the south facing slope of the north wing. Okay. So, so if you look at our building in profile, you'll see a short and then a long. Well, for the south wing, it's short, short, long. And so this is the long. And then it's reversed for the north wing. So the long sides are the collectors for our water system. Mm. I have a uh, question. So this is an unheated space. Yes. Um, per code, you have to have insulation, a solid insulation throughout mm -hmm. between the unheated and the heated space, which you don't have. Hmm. Plus that up mm. over there Interesting. doesn't bring any heat mm. in here. Because it does. Right, no, heat rises. It's going to be right up there. It's never going to bring heat down here. So I find that kind of interesting. That's a good question. And I don't, I'm not an expert on the code, so I can't respond to that in detail. But that's a great question. I think the code requires the exterior walls to be no, between No, between a non-heated and a heated or a non-heated and a cooled, you still have to meet... And and the the glass that we have here, I mean, this is not. This would not be. Well, it's insulated it's, glass. But, but you're talking about the thermal. I'm talking about that opening that's yeah, right. over through. Mm -hmm. The openings wood, you have. So no, there's a gap. There's a hole. That's what you said. That's mm -hmm. where the ventilation air supposedly comes mm -hmm. in. But also, the the beam there is a wood beam. That would, would not have to be insulated. Right. Because there would be a lot of uh, thermal. Yeah. yeah, I just, I just find it interesting. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Don't sit till time, buddy. Uh, <laughs> 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 some blowing polyurethane. <laughs> <laughs> so something to blow the heat down? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't want to cut the conversation <laughs> short on this. <laughs> I'm not trying to hide from anything, but I am going to move us along. <laughs> so feel free to keep talking about it. <laughs> so I mentioned upstairs that um, the water system we saw up there was the beginning of our water system in the building. Um, it will be uh, because our water, our, our own water system is not up and functioning. Um, but I'm going to take you through it as if it is. Uh, so we have the reservoir under the lawn. It's going to come, the piping is going to come into the basement along that wall. 
It's going to come across the ceiling. You'll see two pipes across the ceiling, and one of those will have our reservoir water in it. It will come down and be brought into the filtration system via the pump here. We have a 5 micron filter, which is our first uh, physical treatment of the water. We have calcite treatment, which changes the pH if our rainwater maybe is a little bit acidic. We have activated carbon filtration. We have one micron filtration. And then the primary treatment on the system that we're aiming for is ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light renders bacteria incapable of reproducing, so it's, we're still able to uh, consume the water. Now, you might be asking the question, well, why not chlorination? Because every water system across the country depends on chlorination. Unless, e even if they're using ultraviolet light or, or any other type of, of treatment. Um, so the Living Building Challenge asks us to do whatever we can in this building without the use of chemicals. So that extends to our water system as well. Um, unless the local permitting authority says no. So we have to advocate to do it differently, uh, which is part of the Living Building Challenge. They have an advocacy uh, piece. Um, and if they say no, then we have to go with chlorination. But if they say, well, try an alternative. If it works, then great. If it doesn't work, then you're going to go the traditional route. So we've been in the building two and a half years. Why have we not gotten our water system up and running? Certainly we've had lots of rain. We have lots of water. That's not an issue for us here in, in New England. Um, so there's a, a couple of things, and, and I'm going to branch out to the Kern Center next door, um, which is also a living building here on Hampshire's campus. And they've been uh, working on their water system. They've had theirs up and running. And they've had several months in a row where they've had something called high HPC counts. What is high HPC? HPC is a, me a measurement of the effectiveness of the treatment of chlorine uh, on the water. So it's a, a count of colonies of bacteria and then the effectiveness of the chlorine on those colonies. Um, and so there's a standard that's set for a public water supply. We have a public water supply here because we have more than 25 people in the building. So we're held accountable to that standard. Um, and so for the Kern Center, they had these high counts and they had to come back off of their water and onto town water. And we saw that happening and we thought, hmm, well, we, we wonder if we're going to have the same problem as well. So we just thought we would wait and see how that works out um, before we bring our water system online. So we're still in the process because treating water uh, is a difficult thing to do. Um, and treating it with ultraviolet light is a difficult thing to do because what happens with chlorine is you start the treatment at the source, the water treatment plant, like here, and then there's a chlorine residual all the way to the tap so that those back colonies of bacteria are being uh, treated and addressed all the way to the tap. But if you don't have that treatment all the way to the tap, then you can have colonies of bacteria building up at the tap. So that's um, one thing that we're resolving. Um, why not use the boiling it or um, reverse osmosis? Mm -hmm. Good questions. And I don't know exactly. <laughs> maybe, maybe boiling it takes additional energy that didn't meet our energy goal. Um, and I don't, I'm not fully up to speed on reverse osmosis but to speak to that. you still have the same issue that between the RO filter and the faucet, you could still have bacteria build up. It's possible. And did you well, say Presumably, if there's no bacteria that makes it past the, the UV, then, then there's no bacteria to grow downstream from it, is there? Right, but it could it enter from backwards. the faucet. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. Go backwards. Go backwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you were to sample water from your system, how would it compare to town water? Um, I, 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 or, or Poland spring bottles. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. And actually, we're really looking forward to the day when we do bring our water online so we can actually do like a taste test and maybe maybe a, maybe a sampling test to see what the, the sampling. Um, the you other know. thing that's weird about it is we actually don't end up drinking most of the water. Yes. Right. And so you mm -hmm. could have a final end stage process just, just for the, the drinking, faucet. right, mm -hmm. the faucet. Mm -hmm. But if you're feeding it to your 
in your toilets or, or yes. in your dishwasher, you probably don't. Yes. Yeah, but then it well, would be easier to just do a separate gray water system. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's yeah. True. Well, the yeah. interesting thing for me here is that, that this is a public water supply. There it is. And it uh, functions in the same regulations, in the same set of uh, supervision and regulations from the DEP that Amherst Water Supply at the uh, at the Atkins Reservoir does, mm -hmm. or anything like that. So you're taking hardware designed for acre feet of water, and you're putting a gallon or two mm -hmm. through it. Mm -hmm. And if yeah. the systems are not, we're, we're, we're reinventing, or inventing a whole new system here mm -hmm. that can that can provide the same water quality standards as the Atkins Reservoir or whatever or the public water supply does. But the hardware to do it at this mm -hmm. scale. That's a, that's a great point, Chris. And I just want to, maybe everybody knows Chris, but Chris Riddle was our uh, owner's project manager on the project. So Chris is very knowledgeable about our project. Um, but I will take that point and transition to the fact that, you know, we have these, these are filter housings, right? So the filters that go inside them, this is the activated carbon filter. So Massachusetts DEP would require us to change this filter three times a year. I believe, if I remember my statistics correctly, that this filter um, can handle 150 gallons a minute. So obviously we're a net zero building that is net zero energy, net zero water. So our average water use in the building is roughly 35 gallons a day. So why did our engineers design a filter for our system that can manage 150 gallons a minute? <laughs> Seems like a little over design. So our system, the, the system next door at the Kern Center has filter housings that are this big Did and the filters are under a hundred dollars each. So when we discovered this, we said, uh oh, we might want to do a slight redesign. So we have invited um, the, the engineer who designed the water system for the Kern Center to come on board to our project. He didn't originally design uh, this water treatment system, but his knowledge is, is being built so much. Um, he's become a local expert, and this is part of Living Building Challenge to, to build local expertise in these alternative systems. So we're working with him and hopefully going through a redesign. But if this system were in our home, it would be fine. It's, because we don't have 25 people living in our home. Yeah, as long no, as we don't have still, a party. It, <laughs> you still wouldn't use that much water. Oh, no, I, right, right. right. But, but if this would be overkill. Mm -hmm. I mean, but yeah, be because, like, because, I mean, uh, this is a yeah, surface. This, it's, yeah, this, right, our home this is a surface water supply, which is a little bit different. I mean, you could do that at your home too, but obviously m many of us who live in rural areas, like myself, have well water. And I don't test my well water on a regular basis. Maybe I should. <laughs> but, you know, there is a difference there. So there could be some contaminants um, coming in as well. There are something like 150 living building challenge buildings that have their plaques on the wall now? There are 22 oh. fully certified oh, yeah. buildings in the world. Right wow, now. and two of them in Amherst. Two in Amherst, yes. <laughs> Within uh, five miles of here. This is a hotbed of living buildings. We have, four, we have four in Western Mass, four living buildings in Western Mass. There's one in Jamaica Plain. Um, there's one being built uh, in uh, Dartmouth, South Dartmouth right now on the South Coast. Uh, I can't remember the other projects in Massachusetts. Those are the ones that come to mind. Is that UMass Dartmouth? Uh, no, it's at the Lloyd Center for the Environment, oh. another environmental education center. Well, when um, you think about it, was that the one in uh, the Smith College, and it, but it's not on the Smith College campus. It's uh, north in Hatfield, West Hatfield. Waitley. Waitley. Mm -hmm. um, and it has enough land area that it could have a well. Mm -hmm. And so they have a conventional well system. Didn't have to go through this whole go around with the, with the public water supply. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, John Over it, building, building is not a living building, is it? It is not. Uh, they were aiming for a LEED. Uh, they were aiming for a LEED certification. I don't know if they have it yet. The John Over design building is at UMass. Um, so if you haven't seen that building, I do recommend it. It's phenomenal. And it also, I will add to that point while we're on is it. That the building that you it's 
The John Oliver design building? At UMass? Yeah. Oh, I think you meant the John Oliver train station. No. Um, so the, the Hitchcock Center and the John Oliver design building uh, have recently uh, received uh, honor awards for sustainable design uh, from the Boston Society of Architects. Um, so it's a very uh, exciting new development. So I'm going to move us on just a little bit here um, to say that one of the main ways that we save uh, water, uh, conserve water in a commercial building like this, um, is through our toilets. How many of you used the toilets already since you've been here? Everybody, awesome. <laughs> so you're all familiar with foam flush toilets and you're all experts, super, because that's one of the requirements of, of coming to our building that you all contribute uh, to our composting system. <laughs> so if you, <laughs> thank you for doing that. Um, so as you know, there's two toilets in each bathroom upstairs. The waste comes down via the diagonal pipe into the Clivus composter below. The solid waste is composted in here. There's pine shavings. Then the human waste is contributed. We have uh, beneficial bacteria that are added every three months. Uh, Clivus services these, so they do come out and add those. Uh, we did have worms added as well. Um, I haven't checked in with them recently to see if they've continued to find the worms, but sometimes the worms don't make it and then we have worms come from another composter and we, we try again. Um, so the solid waste is in the composter here. The liquid waste gets pumped out into these leachate tanks here. Uh, I have a question for you all, which is, why is this leachate tank more full than this one? Hmm. Exactly. <laughs> so we have more women that use the building than men, and so when we do have to have these tanks pumped out, we do pump on the schedule of the women's tank. Um, <laughs> Maybe we would have designed it a little bit differently had we known, but hey, you know, uh, minor details. <laughs> so I just want to um, show you our building dashboard briefly. Um, many green buildings have building dashboards so you can see how they function. And we do have this one up on our website, uh, so you can access it there at any time if you want to see it. We did organize ours through the framework of Living Building Challenge. The challenge has seven petals or categories, but they like to use the image of the flower, uh, so they call them petals. Um, uh, and within each of these petals, there are a series of imperatives for a total of 20 imperatives. And each building that's fully certified has to meet all 20 of those imperatives. So I'm just going to touch on three of them because we don't really have time today to talk about all of them. But Living Building Challenge does aim to be a holistic uh, building uh, approach. Um, so you'll see we have equity in place, health and happiness and beauty here as well as energy, water and materials that I'm going to talk about. So just to touch on energy, you can see that we've generated um, some e solar energy in the last hour. We've borrowed some from the grid and what we've used in the building. And of course today it's pretty gray. We've probably still got some snow on these uh, panels above our heads. So we haven't loaned any. We're not net positive right now. We can dig into that data a little more. You can see in the green where our HVAC system starts up in the morning. The orange is our solar energy generation through the day. We can see that hourly. We can see it daily. You can see those two, three-ish warm days we had in February when our HVAC system actually turned off, uh, which was very nice. Um, and then we can see that monthly. And so you can see the, the height of the solar gain in the summer and then the low point um, in the winter. So just popping over to water briefly, we're going to have a similar thing here. We didn't have any rainfall yesterday. Um, we don't have an update on our water because the information that goes there I actually read manually from our town meter downstairs and I give it to the person who manages the algorithms uh, for our site. So I didn't do that today. He's not on the job and I'm not on that job right now. So, but you can see we have 6,000 gallons uh, in our reservoir, a full re reservoir. And because we've been reading the meter um, for almost a year now, I'm getting close to uh, having a total on that. And I think we're going to be close to about two reservoirs for an entire year for our building. 12,000 gallons. 12,000 gallons. We did have an anomaly. So right now my total is about at 14,000. And that anomaly of 4,000 gallons 
was because we had a oops with our janitorial sink that got left on for about 24 hours at full force. Um, <laughs> so that was 4,000 gallons drained in 24 hours from our, well, not from our reservoir, but if it had been our reservoir, it could have been a little bit um, of a crisis for us. So I want to jump over to materials. We haven't really talked about materials in our building yet. For me, Energy and water are certainly very important, but I think materials is equally as important. Our materials have to be sourced as locally as possible to our site uh, to reduce carbon emissions and also to support local economies. Not everything is sourced locally, um, but for the most part there's a certain percentage um, within uh, certain radii. But the most important thing for me with materials is the red list. And for those of you who've gotten your uh, Daily Hampshire Gazette today, you'll see my Earth Matters column um, on materials in the Gazette. Um, every material in the building has to be vetted against this red list of toxic no-use chemicals and chemical families uh, in the building, unless there's absolutely nothing else available. So when we were down in the basement, we talked a little bit about policy advocacy um, to change how we're managing some of our building systems. This is the market-based advocacy to change the building industry and to change the materials that we're using in our building. So just uh, an example, I mean, we all know about asbestos, we know about lead and mercury. Some of these others might be a little bit newer to us. Um, we see a lot of things now that are BPA-free. BPA-free might be great, but then you need to ask yourself, well, what do they use instead? Because this is chemistry, and chemistry is well, it has a lot of alternatives. So instead of BPA, it might be BPF or BPS, and those chemicals um, may or may not be any better than what we're now free of. Um, formaldehyde, uh, for an example, there's a case study um, with Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans where FEMA brought in trailers uh, to house people who needed temporary housing. The materials in the trailer, I don't know, I don't remember whether it was the, the um, composite wood board or the insulation, had formaldehyde in it. In hot climates, formaldehyde volatilizes. Um, you cannot uh, dissipate that with air conditioning. So people in these small confined spaces were exposed to extreme levels of formaldehyde. They developed respiratory illnesses and in some cases cancers as a result. Um, another something like that. Really Until what? Where they really are in use. I mean, they, they just ship them somewhere else. They, um, they have a lifetime, and then they go on to, I guess, a secondary or tertiary market, and they're supposed to contain a little sticker that says not for, you know, um, home occupancy or something like that. <laughs> but a little sticker is to but, well, I, frankly, it doesn't matter what the size of the sticker is, because if that's all you can afford, then that's what you're going to buy and you're going to live there. So those things can propagate themselves um, in time. Um, I just want to mention one other while we're here, which is this perfluorinated compounds. Is anybody familiar with perfluorinated compounds? A little bit, yeah? Okay, so uh, anybody familiar with Teflon? Yeah. Yeah, stain resistance, stain resistance, water resistance, uh, carpets, uh, fabrics on your couches, on anything you might have in your home. Um, so perfluorinated compounds are behind all of those um, chemicals. They're also um, behind um, uh, firefighting foams. Um, so one of the big things that's happening right now is um, institutions like Harvard, Google, um, these big institutions who are purchasing a lot of products, a lot of fabrics, are trying to eliminate the purchasing of stain resistant and water resistant fabrics from their supply chains um, to get these products um, out of um, the, the out of the supply chain. Um, fire resistant pajamas for kids? <laughs> Yikes, that sounds a little scary. Um, but just, you'll see these uh, in the news. Um, we have contamination sites here in Massachusetts, uh, in New York, in New Hampshire. Um, there are sites across the country. You'll see these as PFAS, PFOA, and PFOS. And right now, there's um, a very good documentary I recommend called The, uh, the Devil We Know. Um, which uh, really gets at uh, some of the cla <laughs> what the chemical companies knew about this, these compounds. Um, 
and the class action lawsuit that sort of brought it out into the public sphere and how everybody in the world may have these products contaminating their bodies. We're, we're seeing a lot of problems with uh, firefighters. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Burning buildings and then yes. chemicals collect on them. Is it Boston that has the highest level of, or is it just Boston that's been, or Cambridge that's been researched that the firefighters? I'm not sure, but I, I do know that in Cambridge we have, we have uh, higher rates. Of yes. Cancer. Yes. 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 What's um, the foam in the in the uh, foam flush toilet? It's um, I I don't know exactly except to tell you that it's an aponal uh, biodegradable alcohol based soap. Uh, but naponal doesn't really tell you much because the, that's the brand. The brand of the toilet is napon toilet, hmm. so it does need to be a biodegradable soap to be in our composters. Yeah. And I just talked briefly about the struggle it is to try to build a whole building without. Mm -hmm using mm -hmm. any yes. of those red list mm -hmm. compounds. Yep. One of them was PVC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Try finding something mm -hmm. that anywhere that doesn't have PVC in it. Pex. What? Pex. Pex. Is that PVC free? No. Yeah. No. 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 Yeah, I think it's PVC free. Oh, it's Let's anywhere in, in the building industry. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so the, uh, the what, what, what right builders, our builder, had to do was to have with working with the architects was find suitable substitutes for all of those things, mm -hmm. and they're everywhere. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a monumental project, um, delivering a building like this that's a healthy building that, uh, that mm -hmm. will not to hurt either the occupants or the construction crew. What did it increase in the cost? Uh, we don't know. I mean, there's no, it's, it's hard to really tangibly say. It's a, I've heard uh, numbers from 5 to 20 percent. <laughs> I don't know. It's. Uh, it's certainly, there is certainly a cost premium because of the administrative cost for no other mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. The time it takes to, to uh, for the contractor to specify a product, so to choose a product that's going to meet the specs and is, <coughs> doesn't have a red list, and then it goes through a, an approval process for every little thing mm -hmm. in the whole building. And, and this is, is part of where Living Building Challenge is uh, trying to change how buildings are built, not only in meeting this standard, but in, um, in doing so, building teams, the builders and the architects have to work together much sooner in the process, because if the architect is specifying 20 lighting fixtures throughout the building, and that building team is going to have to vet all those 20 lighting fixtures, and every piece of that lighting fixture has to be vetted. That's a huge burden. If they can reduce that number to 15 or 10 and, and simplify the building, then the burden of vetting all of those products becomes much easier. Can I talk about the declare list? That's important. Yeah. So uh, Living Building Challenge also has put together something they call the declare list, declare label. Um, which allows manufacturers to step forward on their own initiative to put together basically an ingredient label for their product. It doesn't necessarily mean that, it's, uh, that it meets the red list and doesn't have any of those chemicals, but it does allow the industry to self-declare, um, and it's a starting point for teams. Um, so to talk about the building structure, uh, the timber framing of the structure is glue lamb or Nordic lamb. It's made of black spruce and it's made of small pieces of trees uh, that are glued together with a water-based glue to make a super strong uh, engineered structure. We now have at least three buildings in Amherst that are made uh, with this timber framing. The other buildings are all more than one story, so the timber framing in those buildings is much bigger and beefier than it is uh, here. Um, we have pl press plate trusses holding up our roof, very standard um, in construction. Um, not finished carpentry, but again, we're a teaching uh, building, and so we wanted everything to be visible. Um, we have a tongue and groove spruce product on the walls and on the ceiling. On the outside of our walls and roof, we have six inches of reclaimed polyiso rigid insulation. And then on the outside of our walls, uh, we have cedar uh, siding. Underneath our slab, we have four inches of insulation. So we have a very tightly wrapped building envelope. And because all of our mechanicals are on the inside of the building, then our walls and our roof, for the most part, can be uh, solid. And we have very few uh, penetrations that can transfer energy in those wall systems. 
want to say that, um, so we've, we've talked about our drinking water in the building, we talked about our black water in the building, we talked a little bit about storm water in the building, uh, or outside the building, hopefully. <laughs> um, but we did not talk about gray water in the building. So we do have a gray water system here, so obviously that's the water that goes down our sinks. It goes into a septic system outside, to a sand trap filter, and then gravity feeds into our constructed wetland. From the constructed wetland, if there's an overflow or an excess of water, it can go into our leach field. So that is a pilot system for us. So we do have the septic tank and the leach field, and it's interrupted by the constructed wetland. So you don't use it for flushing the toilets? Or we do for not. Spraying water into the composter downstairs? Nope. It only goes back and transpires back into the environment. Well, or what do you use it for? We don't use the gray water. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean it's, it's from our rain, right. When we get our water system up and running, it will be from our rainwater to the sinks and then back into the gray water system. And then either transpired or if excess goes into the leach field, down into the ground. So excess, we're just letting it go. The excess for your reservoir now goes into the leach field too? The excess from no. our reservoir. So our reservoir does have a flow through capability so we don't have standing water in there. Um, and so that overflow goes into our bioswale. <coughs> so then it just filtrates back into the, into oh, the ground. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one last thing, when we did move here to this site uh, in Hampshire, uh, as much of this part of Amherst was, it was an apple orchard at one time, and they used a lead arsenic spray on mm -hmm. the orchards, and so we had arsenic contamination in our soil here, and we decided to do a seven to nine inch uh, removal across the entire site, mm -hmm. uh, scraping off of that soil. We did bury it in our parking lot, um, so it's here on site, we didn't have to uh, spend time or money or energy uh, chalking it away, um, but then we had to bring in clean fill to replace what we had taken away. Um, and then we've been planting um, native species to do a recovery on our site. And if you were here last summer, it was full of pollinators because we had flowers everywhere in our field out front and all around. Um, so we do have um, trails that go out into Hampshire's campus, which all of our programs use. Um, we do have um, around this uh, play area here, we have a mud kitchen. We've got some uneven logs. We have some willow structures. So we're growing some willow trees. Uh, we planted uh, stakes last year, last spring. So they'll be growing into willows and then we'll weave them together to form a structure so that the kids can go inside and have a little play space. Um, and then we're finishing up with some additional teaching areas outside which are yet to come. So thank you for coming on the tour today. Um, I'm happy to hang out and answer any questions or you can challenge me on things that I have yet to learn um, still. But you're also free to head out if you'd like to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.